Good day everyone! I am Jana Denise Domingo, a second year student taking a Bachelor of Secondary Education, major in English. For today's lesson, I am going to discuss about the literature under the New Republic during 1946 to 1985. So for our objectives, we are going to number one, discuss the famous literary works according to the elements of poetry, rhyme, rhythm, and stanza. Number two, Analyze literary selections that exemplify the multivalent Filipino experiences and their multivocal articulations. And lastly, number three, draw out the meaning of the poem. In literature under the New Republic, it is the time of Japanese occupation. The Japanese occupation leaves the Philippine economy in ruins and it seemed that massive foreign aid could rebuild it. With the life of the Filipinos hanging in the balance because of hunger, insecurity, and terror. Many Filipinos resorted to collaborating with the Japanese for reasons such as politics, survival, and opportunity. After the Pacific War ended, collaborators were given amnesty by President Manuel Rojas. This in turn put the Filipino ruling elite's credibility at stake because of ambiguities and irregularities that was not resolved. The U.S. colonialists also linked the issue of collaboration not as a political will but as a means of survival or expediency. The elites had a lot of influence to the masses and the U.S. wanted to top their services and use them as leverage. To secure the New Republic's alliance with the U.S. after its independence was granted, a series of treaties and agreements were signed and this strengthened the ties between the two countries. It is the Bell Trade Act. It imposed free trade which enforced imports from U.S. for 28 years and parity rights allowing U.S. citizens to have equal rights to access to the country's natural resources. The Philippine Rehabilitation Act, together with the Bell Trade Act, which allowed the U.S. to use the Philippines for their military. With the U.S. serving as crutches to the Philippines, westernization occurred. The Educational Exchange Program, otherwise known as the Fulbright Program, was the key to the Philippine assimilation of U.S. culture. The program actually aimed at two-way exchange of culture, but this did not actually happen. This was the time when Filipino artists, writers, and musicians were given a chance to go to the U.S. to learn about the country. They also were given lecturing privilege. The impact of this program can be seen in terms or the artwork and in literature that showed in their works that they are able to keep up with the literary and artistic trends of the U.S. during that time. They were introduced to what was called the New Criticism, a method which emphasized close analysis of text and structure rather than analysis of social or biographical contexts. In literature, the critical theory that had a marked influence on the thinking of creative writers and their critics was the New Criticism a highly sophisticated critical method resting on the assumption that the literary work being a verbal construct. Literature could be studied or produced as an object with an autonomous life of its own. The theory and method behind new criticism in the Philippine setting gave academic respectability to Villiers' atheism, endowing what was the otherwise a personal and impressionistic approach to writing with concreteness and demonstrability. Thus, New criticism became a justification for writing that abandoned the traditional social role assigned to it by the classics of the propaganda movement and the revolution. No doubt, it had a positive effect on writers. It sharpened their awareness of the vital relationships between craftsmanship and the effectiveness of the literary work. New criticism paid way to Maganda Pang Daidig, Bartolina, Walking Home, Insipolog, Akon Daidig, and Summer Solstice. Here are some of the Filipinas who had given a privilege to be known as artists in literature. First is Lazaro Francisco, a Filipino writer known for his novels such as Ama and Laluyong. He was awarded the National Artist for Filipino Literature in 2009. Francisco also received the Republic Cultural Heritage Award for Literature in 1970. Next is Amado Vera Hernandez, a Filipino writer and labor leader who was known for his criticism of social injustices in the Philippines and was later imprisoned for his involvement 
and the Communist Movement. Emmanuel Torres, a poet, art critic, professor of English and Comparative Literature at the Ateneo de Manila University. He was born on April 29, 1932 in Maria Torres and obtained his BA education at the Ateneo de Manila University. And in 1957, on a Fulbright Smith Mund Fellowship where he obtained his Masteral in Arts in English at the State University of Iowa where he enjoyed an international scholarship in creative writing and attended Paul Engels Writers Workshop. He joined the Ateneo faculty in 1958 and since 1960, he was the curator of the Ateneo de Manila University Art Gallery. At the Ateneo, he held the Henry Lee Irwin Chair in Creative Writing and the FEBTC or Jose B. Fernandez Chair for Art Research. In addition to the extensive local and international recognition, he received awards for his work in the arts and letters. NVM Gonzalez He was proclaimed National Artist of the Philippines in 1997. He died on November 28, 1999 in Quezon City. He was born on September 8, 1915 in Romblon, Philippines. On April 14, 1987, the University of the Philippines conferred on NVM Gonzalez the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa for his creative genius in shaping the Philippine short story and novel and making a new clearing within the English idiom and tradition on which he established an authentic vocabulary. For his insightful criticism by which he advanced the literary tradition of the Filipino and enriched the vocation for all writers of the present generation. For his visions and auguries by which he gave the Filipino sense and sensibility a profound and unmistakable script read and reread throughout the international community of letters. Next, Alejandro G. Abadilla. He was born on March 10, 1906 and died on August 26, 1969. He is commonly known as Aga, a Filipino poet, essayist, and fiction writer. Critic Pedro Ricarte referred to Abadilla as the father of modern Philippine poetry and was known for challenging established forms and literatures, excessive romanticism, and emphasis on rhyme and meter. And last, Nick Joaquin, a Filipino writer, historian, and journalist best known for his short stories and novels in the English language. Joaquin was born in Paco, Manila, and one of ten children of Leocadio Joaquin, a colonel under General Emilio Aguinaldo in the 1896 revolution, and Salome Marquez, a teacher of English and Spanish. He also wrote using the pen name Quijano de Manila. Joaquin was conferred the rank and the title of National Artist of the Philippines for Literature. He is considered one of the most important Filipino writers in English and the third most important overall after Jose Rizal and Claro M. Nicomedes. For additional information, Maganda Pang Daidig is a novel made by Lazaro Francisco in 1955. It was about Lino Rivera, a son of a farmer who goes through many trials due to the problems of land and tenancy in the countryside. Walking Home is a poem made by Emmanuel S. Torres, where his ideas are undoubtedly brought to life through his vivid imagery, by taking the concept of home and turning it into one that we never see it as. He has forced us to not only see point of view of an ordinary person, but also made us experience the feelings of the prisoner. In New Criticism, there was a literature published such as A Merger of Traditions, reflecting the Tagabugid and Tagabayan, the two cultures that made up the political entities, the educated and the wealthy, and the ones who lacked the education and therefore did not qualify to exercise power. The Tagabayan were more inclined to the culture of the free world, while the Tagabukid was the nationalistic and anti-American. Also, during this period, 
The transition from the Euro-Hispanic, a socially conscious deals with reality, period to the Anglo-American, who thrived more on aesthetic qualities and was full of sentimentality and skepticism period, of literature in the Philippines was brought about by Villa. The contradictions between the two styles resulted in the emphasis of a crisis for the Anglo-American tradition. It was later resolved in the 1970s. These two traditions had been implanted with indigenous traditions and through the efforts of the Filipino writers can be clearly called the Filipino literary tradition. Existentialism and the Search for Identity When President Ramon Magsaysay died of a plane crash in Cebu, this provoked an intellectual crisis. Claro M. Recto criticized President Ramon Magsaysay for being submissive to the U.S. With the death of Ramon Magsaysay, the country was under confusion and the people beginning to ask Recto for some answers that would shed some light regarding the country's political philosophy. However, Recto was not able to finish what he started because he dies in Rome of a heart attack. With Recto's death, the cultural scene in the Philippines became an extension of the U.S. Many major publications in New York were brought to the Manila. Literary works included were poetry, fiction, and drama. The latest literary fads in the West spread like wildfire. Some of the creative writers whose work were read by Filipinos were Jean Paul Satre and Albert Camus. Now, we are moving to one of Nick Joaquin's literature entitled May Day Eve. Nicomedes Marquez Joaquin, earlier discussed as a Filipino writer, historian, and journalist, best known for his short stories and novels in the English language, he also wrote using the pen name Quijano de Manila or Manila Old Timer. After being read poems and stories by his mother, the boy Joaquin read widely in his father's library and at the National Library of the Philippines. By then, his father had become a successful lawyer after the revolution. From reading, Joaquin became interested in writing, and at the age of 17, Joaquin had his first piece published in the literary section of the pre-World War II Tribune, where he worked as a proofreader. It was accepted by the writer and editor Seraphine Lanot after Joaquin won a nationwide essay competition to honor Lad Naval de Manila. Sponsored by the Dominican Order, the University of Santo Tomas awarded him an honorary association in arts and awarded him a scholarship to St. Albert's Convent. His career has many ups and downs. After returning to the Philippines, Joaquin joined the Philippines Free Press, starting as a proofreader. Soon, he attracted notice for his poems, stories, and plays, as well as his journalism under the pen name Quijano de Manila. His journalism was both intellectual and provocative, an unknown genre in the Philippines at that time, and he raised the level of reportage in the country. Joaquin deeply admired Jose Rizal, the national hero of the Philippines. Joaquin paid tribute to him in books such as The Storyteller's New Medium, Rizal in Saga, The Complete Poems and Plays of Jose Rizal, and A Question of Heroes, Essays in Criticism on 10 Key Figures of Philippine History. He translated the hero's valedictory poem in the original Spanish, Mi Ultimo Adios, as Land That I Love, Farewell. Joaquin represented the Philippines at the International Pen Congress in Tokyo in 1957 and was appointed as a member of the Motion Pictures Commission under the presidents Josdado Macapagal and Ferdinand E. Marcos. After being honored as national artist, Joaquin used his position to work for intellectual freedom in society. He secured the release of imprisoned writer Jose F. Lacaba. At a ceremony on Mount Makiling, attended by the First Lady Imelda Marcos, Joaquin delivered an invocation to Mariang Makiling, the mountain's mythical maiden. Joaquin touched on the importance of freedom and the artist. After that, Joaquin was excluded by the Marcos regime as a speaker from important cultural events. Joaquin died of cardiac arrest in the early morning of April 29, 2004 at his home in San Juan, Metro Manila. 
He was then editor of Philippine Graphic Magazine, where he worked with Juan P. Dayang, who was the magazine's first publisher. Joaquin was also publisher of its sister publication, Mirror Weekly, a women's magazine. He also wrote the column Small Beer for the Philippine Daily Inquirer and Issue, an opinion tabloid. Nick Joaquin was born in the old district of Paco in Manila, Philippines on September 15, 1917 the fifth day of St. Nicomedes, a proto-martyr of Rome after whom he took his baptismal name. Some claimed his correct birth date was May 4, 1917. Whichever was right, Nick was born to a home deeply Catholic, educated, and prosperous family. His father, Leocadio Joaquin, was a procurador, or attorney, in the court of first instance of Laguna at the time of the Philippine Revolution. Around 1906, after the death of his wife, his first wife, he married Salome Marquez, Nick's mother. A friend of General Emilio Aguinaldo, Leocadio was a popular lawyer in Manila and the southern Tagalog provinces. Nick was the fifth child of ten children who had an extremely happy childhood. Their parents were able to provide them a decent and privileged life. However, in 1920s, Leocadio lost the family's fortune in an oil exploration investment somewhere in the Visayas. This was the turning point in the life of the Joaquins. After that, Nick dropped out of school and his intention of entering the seminary to pursue his religious vocation was abandoned. Later, his work in the composing department of the Tribune of the TBT or Tribune Vanguardia Taliba Publishing Company get him started on what would be a lifelong association with the world of print. Right after the war, he published in rapid succession stories as Summer Solstice, Mayday Eve, and Gorgia de Honor. These stories have been Nick Joaquin's signature stories and classics in Philippine writing in English. In 1947, Joaquin's earlier dream of leaving Manila after the war came to reality when he was awarded a scholarship to the St. Albert's College, a Dominican monastery in Hong Kong after he published his essay, La Naval de Manila, in 1943. It was, the, uh, it was the, a description of Manila's fabled resistance to 17th century during Dutch invaders. His stay at St. Albert schooled him in Latin and the classics. He stayed less than two years and returned to Manila thereafter. Nick Joaquin wrote with eloquence and verve on the most democratic range of subjects, from the arts and popular culture to history and current politics. He was a widely read chronicler of the times, original and provocative in his insights, and energetic and compassionate in his embrace of local realities. Like the novel The Woman Who Had Two Navels in 1961, examines his country's various heritages, a portrait of the artist as Filipino in 1966, a celebrated play attempts to reconcile historical events with dynamic change. May Day Eve by Nicomedes Marquez Joaquin So for the plot of the story we're going to discuss, regrets come late. As for the plot structure, the main problem started when young Badoy Montilla cornered Agueda in the dark room alone. She asked him to free her but he insisted having a dance with her until she struggled for her freedom. But he was stronger than she was. When the candle went off, Agueda started to cry not because of fear in the dark but because she hated how Badoy behaved. Badoy started to apologize sensing Agueda's discomfort but she refused the apology. Instead, when she had the chance, she beat Batoy's fingers forcing him to retaliate by slapping her, but she avoided and fled away from him. That started their unending conflicts. For the climax, the two were married, Badoy Montilla and Nagueda. Unfortunately, that marriage was not the solution to their problem, but the cause of the complications. None of them admitted their real feelings for each other. They both found hell in their marriage. They both considered each other as devil and witch, which inflicts them harm and pain. The resolution? The heart grows weary. The body succumbs to pain. 
Doña Agueda, was not able to bear it anymore. Her death signaled the realization for Don Badoy. He loved her all those times. It was a pity she will never know it anymore. Oftentimes, we realize the blessings we have only when they are gone. For Badoy and Agueda, life and love were wasted. Living together, suppressing the lovely gifts of these two most precious gifts because of pride and prejudice for each other is the most painful experience a couple could have. It has been mentioned that Badoy was luckier because he still had a chance to reminisce the past with Agueda and take joy in the pleasant memories of his hidden love for her, while Agueda was unfortunate not to know the truth about her husband's love for her. However, by the constructing principle, it could be noted that it was unfortunate for Badoy to live suffering the anguish of unex unexpressed love for Agueda. Regrets come to Badoy too late when he realized the precious gift he had lost. But in the end, to mention the binary opposite description of loving being a sweet sorrow experience, the characters of Badoy and Agueda must be blessed to have one May Day Eve in their lives and have instant feelings of love even if they have uh, even if they choose not to demonstrate it. And that is to sum the meaning of the plot where regrets do come late. Here's the main characters in the story, following their characterizations and roles. Young Agueda, the pretty young woman who is curious, hard-headed, brave, and proud. She was married to Badoy Montilla, but never bowed down to admit her admiration for Badoy. She died losing her youth and living a lonely married life. Agueda is the most dynamic character in the story, and the one with severe internal conflict. Although her dynamism is not reflected in the changes of her personality, she was responsible in the changes which happened to Badoy after her death. In her first encounter with Badoy, um, Agueda demonstrated hard-headedness, pride, and bravery. But there were moments during her life together with Badoy that she recognized her admiration for him, although she chose not to demonstrate, dem she chose not to be demonstrative about it. In other words, while living as a wife of Badoy, Agueda was in pain of keeping her feelings for him, brought about by her pride and prejudice to Badoy. Next is young Badoy Montilla, the vain, good-looking man who will do everything to get what he wants. He was a vengeful fellow who married Agueda, but never admitted he had, he had loved her since the night he cornered her in that dark room until she died. The vanity and good looks of Badoy used by Nick Joaquin to symbolize what man once did not totally work well on Agueda. In fact, it was the charm she hated most in him. It was the charm that made him the vengeful and proud man who never admitted his real feelings for Agueda because she choose, uh, because she too chose not. Anastasia, the old woman who is loyal to her mistress and believes in supernatural beings, she taught Agueda the incantation which can make her see the face of the person she is to marry. Anastasia's belief of the supernatural beings emphasizes other people's perspective about the role of fate in one's life. In the story May Day Eve, both Badoy and Agueda believed they were trapped in the magic of the mirror one night in their lives and thought they were fated for each other. Unfortunately, the mirror seemed to have lied and they did not do anything to save what was in them for their relationship to have triumphed. Daughter of Doña Agueda and Don Badoy a curious girl who was persistent in knowing her mother's past. And last, Voltaire, Don Badoy and Don Agueda's grandson, who, like his mother, heard the story of witches that bewitch, drank the blood, and ate the hearts of his grandparents. For the setting, the story happened in the year 1847 on May Day Eve. It deals with witchcraft as depicted in She Bewitch Me, Blended with horror as evident in She Sucked My Blood and Ate My Heart and flavored with fiction as expressed in the superstitious belief of the devil and the witch coming out of the mirror if everything in the ritual will go wrong. These are descriptions of the anguish one has to go through 
when he chooses not to be true to about his feelings. For the conflict, there are two. Man versus man, meaning uh, the conflict between Badoy and Agueda. Then man versus self, where both Badoy and Agueda has conflicts within themselves. There is the presence of internal and external conflicts all through what the story. And that encounter in that dark room, young Badoy already realized how sudden he fell in love with young Agueda. But when they married, they both manifested regret and revealed hatred for each other as reflected in their description of each other as a devil who inflicts them harm. Out of pride and desolation, Agueda bore it out until death. After her death, the painful realization for Badoy was depicted. The tragedy was that it was too late for him to tell her the truth about how he felt, that she loved her all through those years of pain and hating. The main symbol used in the story is the mirror, which refers to the physical attractions of Badoy and Agueda for each other and the illusion brought about by those attractions. The mirror symbolizes the physical attraction of Badoy and Agueda had for each other. Even in their first meeting, the attraction was already tense, which they thought to be love. On the part of Agueda, this is manifested in her recall of Badoy's flashing eyes, very elegant mustache, fine clothes, and curly hair, as reflected in the mirror. On the part of Badoy, his physical attraction was evident in seeing the young Agueda's charms, tremendous beauty, and the eyes she had, bare shoulders gold in the candlelight and delicately freed the mobile insolence of her neck and her taut breast, her enchanting fire and grace, her hair that was like black waters as they were reflected in the same mirror. The illusion became evident when they married and thought of each other as fatal creatures. The symbolism of illusion was reinforced when that physical attraction was not transformed into something more positive during their marriage years. The theme, love cannot be based on passion alone, nor in superstitious beliefs and in faith. The story of Badoy Nagueda, which was founded on physical attraction, is a proof that love cannot be based on passion alone. It has to be deeply rooted from respect and acceptance of each other. It has to be constantly worked on, nurtured, earned, and given willingly rather than be based on on superstitions and faith, it is only under this criteria that love grows and blossoms. Otherwise, like the story of Badoy and Agueda, love will be blinded and will be turned into hatred. Then, the regrets and realization of what we actually had when it is already gone. The lesson of May Day Eve is considered by most to be that marriage should only be a result of love. The story demonstrates how love is very different from lusts and that it takes a certain level of maturity to differentiate between the two. As for the conclusion of the story, if the mirror is a symbolism of an illusion, then this story could be about someone's illusionary love affair as portrayed by the different characters. If we have to consider the fact that some writers' literary pieces are autobiographical, then maybe the story has something to do with Nick Wilkins unfulfilled romantic relationship. In his biographies, there is no mention of Wilkins' romantic involvement with opposite gender except admiration from a lot of his female fans. Moreover, there is no mention of whether he was a married or a single person until his death. But whatever it is, the truth remains about his being an exemplary literary person whose legacy is recorded in the country's history. The main theme of the story Made Eve is that love is not founded on magic, for it to grow and blossom. Lovers should nurture the seed by watering it with acceptance and respect for each other. There is no way for love to prosper in proud and hateful hearts. Love is never proud nor vengeful. To be happy in love, one has to manifest it through actions. Finally, it is the lovers who decide to succeed or to fail in loving and not fail. There are also figures of speech being used. In the short story, it has stated figures of speech such as in personification, the blind black houses mutters hush hush, 
an evil old moon prowled about in a corner or where a murderous wind whirled whistling and whining. It is the same with the hyperbole. She bewitched me and she tortured me. She ate my heart and drank my blood. I saw the devil. Lastly, May Day Eve is definitely a literary masterpiece, an irony at its best. It is able to paint a rare dimension of a very complicated subject matter called love through the use of tale hardly having unexpected twists and turns. It goes beyond the conventional perception of love of man, which is represented by flowers and chocolates, passionate words, warm hugs, and a lot more sweet things in the world. It explores a greater depth, exposing how love ironically brings pain and sorrow. May the Eve does all of this while keeping the readers interested. So that is all for today. I hope you learned from what I have discussed. Thank you for listening. God blessed.